In NMO, there's always something new to be talked about. Uh, for one thing, and there are three trials right now. Um, so right now, there's nothing FDA approved for treatment in NMO. But there are three trials underway, which is amazing that we have the support of pharmaceutical companies. Um, one of them by Alexion is a complement inhibitor. One of them by Chugai involves IL-6. And then a third one by Metamune is uh, CD19, attaches to CD19 and depletes those cells. So similar to one of the therapies that we use off-label at this moment, rituximab. We also are involved in more acute treatment trials because always we want to better. Uh, so the disability, unlike in MS, there's really no progressive stage in NMO. And so if you stop the attacks, you stop the accrual of disability. And so we're very motivated to, of course, stop the attacks with these types of medications, but then also to help recovery from those attacks since we haven't been that successful in completely stopping the attacks in most patients. We have another CD19 targeted medication, ublituximab, that we're trying in acute treatment trials, mostly for, uh, or only for safety at this moment. But um, we also, in the past, had used a medication called Synrise, and that one seemed to have uh, been good enough and safe enough that that's going to move forward in bigger trials for safety. That's also a complement inhibitor. It's a constantly evolving field and really needs to be because uh, it's a rare disease. It's actually an ultra rare disease, so under 10,000 is ultra rare. But for the people who have it, it's quite devastating. You know, blindness, paralysis, even still a high mortality and a high um, diagnosis. Uh, incorrect diagnosis rate with this disease. So we really want to do what we can to educate people better and then to treat our patients better. Luckily, there's the Guthie Jackson Charitable Foundation who uh, is also very motivated to help with patient advocacy, patient education, practitioner edu education and research. So they've been a great ally as well. Right now, um, off-label, we use, mostly in the United States, we use azathioprine, which is a general immunosuppressant. It uh, generally immunosuppresses targeting B and T cells, as does mycophenolate. And then we use rituximab, which again just targets B cells and completely depletes them to zero. We did actually put together data, uh, our group at Johns Hopkins, with UT Southwestern and uh, Dean Wingerchuk's group at uh, Mayo in Scottsdale a few years ago and looked at our patient cohort and tried to figure out what those failure rates were. It was retrospective, so not as clean of data as, as you might like, but um, we take what we can and of course in such a rare disease it's hard to recruit lots of people to big studies. So retrospective data is certainly useful. And we found that in azathioprine, for example, which was the first medication ever really tried in NMO by the Mayo Group, um, there's as high as a 53% failure rate, which is really not acceptable. Um, luckily, with mycophenolate and rituximab, the numbers are a lot better, about 20% failure rate, and it kind of depends on how well you monitor uh, certain labs for both of those medications to make sure that it, their patients are actually on the dose that's going to be effective for them. But um, those are the medications we tend to use. Oftentimes, uh, they're in more favor than the azathioprine. Also, Mayo did a series on 99 patients on azathioprine, and three of them developed lymphoma. So that's not really a, a acceptable side effect if there are better options. So rituximab and mycophenolate are great options for now, but we always are striving for better ones. We also know from uh, another collaborative study with those same centers that there's still a pretty high rate of misdiagnosis early in the disease. So oftentimes those three particular centers as well as some others, um, Stanford, UCSF and others, uh, tend to be a secondary referral center and so patients have already perhaps been misdiagnosed and then down the line they are, it's suggested they may have NMO and then they show up at our doorstep and so oftentimes they've been in, not only inadequately treated but poorly treated such that it actually did them harm with MS medications. And so um, by the time they get to us, we, there is still quite a high um, 
uh, misdiagnosis rate, unfortunately. And like I said, that's harmful for the patients. And there's a very specific blood test. It's very specific. If you're positive and have anything going on in your central nervous system, your workup is done. We know that you have NMO. The problem is that it's not uh, completely sensitive. There's still about 30 to 40 percent of people who will test negative for it despite having the disease. And so it's those people that really can be a quandary for people who aren't experts, aren't seeing this every day in the way that we are. And you can imagine with a disease that rare, many neurologists go their entire life without seeing it. Most neuroimmunologists see it in, within their careers, but it not commonly where they really can make these distinctions in a patient that's negative. So those are the tough ones. We know that NMO medications work in MS. And the, since I mentioned the reverse isn't true, we always think that it's better, know that it's better to hedge your bets and treat with something that's going to treat both diseases rather than just the one if you don't know.